Dr. Garman, how did you become interested in gerontology? Like many gerontologists, it was a personal experience that moved me into the field. And when I was doing my graduate work, um, I didn't have any interest in gerontology, and so I was not pursuing that when I was getting my doctorate. What moved me into the field was um, my mother was diagnosed with cancer um, at age 72, and I was shocked at how the healthcare providers and the social worker, um, their ageism and their sexism and in interacting with her. Now this was a very different time period. This was 1978, uh, and it was before hospice existed, in, certainly in the community, and she was in Cleveland. Um, but it was just seeing how much she was discounted as an older woman who had terminal cancer and that they felt there was there just this very discounting of her. And I was so angered by that, and particularly by a social worker who treated her in that way, that it became my goal to make sure that social workers were better prepared and how to work with older people, and particularly older women. And my hope was that if I really was successful in pursuing that goal or my, that passion, that other older women, women wouldn't be treated as disrespectfully as she was treated. Unfortunately, I think there's still many instances in which um, healthcare providers and social workers may be both ageist and sexist uh, in interacting with older women. But it was that personal experience that really made me start rethinking what it was I wanted to do in terms of my role as an educator with social work students. So I wasn't formally trained in the sense of having lots of coursework. What I then did was take as many workshops and seminars and institutes, and at that point in time, University of Michigan had two week long summer workshops on aging. Um, I read vociferously. <laughs> I did volunteer work uh, with older adults, you know, and that was what moved me along. But I think it's so true that, and I know there's been surveys that, you know, most people, we don't grow up, at least in that time period, and grow up saying, gee, I want to be a gerontologist. <laughs> you know, and, and so it's some kind of personal experience that has made people rethink what they wanted to do with their lives. Yeah. And could you describe your career trajectory as a gerontologist? So my, as I said, you know, my trajectory was a little bit different in terms of getting launched. Um, and at that point in time, I was at the University of Minnesota. I wasn't teaching aging because there weren't any aging courses. Um, but I think where the real shift occurred for me was um, when I was hired at the University of Washington, I was hired to coordinate what was then called the Projects on Aging. And in many ways, they took a leap of faith with me, <laughs> you know, since again, I hadn't been teaching aging up until then. But I certainly, I had been doing research on rural older women, uh, and certainly, you know, I was eager to teach aging courses. Um, so that, you know, that was when I think, you know, I clearly started making the career shift that this is how I want to be identified as a gerontological social worker. And um, that's when I started teaching courses in aging, working with students, had my first doctoral student uh, um, doing research on caregiving. So I, it, was, it was really fortunate I had that opportunity to move into a new position and have that position be one that was focused on aging. Um, at what point in your career did you embrace gerontologists to describe yourself? Well, I think it really was at that point of, of making that move to coordinating the, the aging concentration. And that was such a different time period, again, in terms of funding for students. The Administration on Aging had very generous stipends. Um, when I took over the 
concentration. Well, not when I took it over, but after, after I'd been there for several years, we had 42 students um, taking courses in aging. That's a huge number. <laughs> yeah, I can tell by the look on your face, that's a huge number. And um, part of that was there were stipends that moved students that maybe thought, I never want to work with older adults. They loved getting the stipend and they got, they got hooked. Um, and it was, it was a very exciting time at the University of Washington because there was also a tremendous amount of funding um, for interdisciplinary work. Uh, and we had interdisciplinary placements and seminars in skilled nursing facilities and home health care in senior centers, we had a wellness project. You know, many things that now there's so much focus on interdisciplinarity. Well, we were doing it in the 80s and it sort of moved away, <laughs> you know, and now we're embracing it again. So that, it was just a very, it was a research rich environment. There were lots of opportunities, lots of opportunities to get external funding. Uh, and so that was really how, you know, I fully embraced the role at that point, and I don't think anyone, you know, was questioning my commitment. There were times, you know, and I think this may still be true. I was I was relatively young when I when I began teaching at the University of Washington, and there were times when I would be teaching aging and feeling a little bit like an imposter, in the sense that it's always that challenge of how can you, as a younger person, really understand what it's like to be older. Um, now I no longer have that challenge, <laughs> uh, but you know I think that's often true for younger people in the field. Is what's your what's your credibility in terms of life experience? Um, but you know it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't anything that made a difference, and except that I was always open to learning from uh, the older adults I interacted with and, and really hearing their perspectives. Did you have female mentors who inspired your move into gerontology? It just didn't inspire the move, um, unless you think of my mother inspired the move by watching her experience. But then once I was moving into the field, um, I had some really was profoundly impacted by Tish Summers and Laura Shields from the Older Women's League. And in the 1985 White House Conference on Aging, there was also a special uh, conference on women in aging, and Tish Summers and Lori put that together. And they, I don't know if, if you ever knew them, but they were such inspiring women. They were women that um, in midlife were faced with divorce, faced the reality of suddenly having greatly reduced income, lack of health care, and they were passionate about advocating for equity for older women in terms of social security um, in particular. They were just, and they started the Older Women's League. We, I was at the meeting in which that was started and it was in, held in Iowa. It was a profound experience, you know, seeing that organization being birthed. So they had a huge impact. And, and particularly my area is policy, so you know, in terms of their activism and their ability to influence uh, national legislation. Um, other women that impacted me, but in different ways, um, Elaine Brody as a gerontological social worker and as someone whose research on caregiving I greatly admired. She, she wasn't directly a mentor at, at, in any sense, but her work certainly impacted me, and the early work that she did on women in the middle and the concept of the sandwich generation. Um, and similarly, not a direct mentoring effect, but I was greatly influenced by Carol Estes' uh, work and the whole political construction of aging and the concept of the aging enterprise. And again, because of my, my focus on policy and macro issues, but it, but it wasn't, none of those women were explicitly mentors uh, in the sense of how we think of mentoring today where someone's really spending a lot of time with you, and, but they certainly impacted me to think 
um, very strongly about women's issues and the tremendous inequities that older women face and continue to face. Um, so that's that's who I need to see. Oh, the pers another person though that's again in terms of activism was Maggie Kuhn and the Grey Panthers. And there's, yeah, talk about being inspired <laughs> by watching someone having such an impact on, on policy and on just general awareness of aging. Uh, continuing on that note, what is unique about being a woman in general? Well, I think at, at the point at which I was, was launching my career, um, it, there were certainly, particularly in social work where women predominate, it wasn't as if it was a distinctive status per se. But um, at that point, there was so little attention to women's issues and, you know, the Baltimore Longitudinal Study didn't add women till I think it was in the 80s or late 70s. And um, when women were included in studies, it was often as an afterthought. <laughs> or, and sex was just thought as one minor variable that you would look at in terms of, of differences. And certainly how areas that impacted women's health were, were so underfunded. When I think about menopause and osteoporosis and a lot of issues that are, are more women's issues than men's issues, there, the funding was so, um, so much, disproportionately so much less. So it was at that point in the 80s, it was more the relative invisibility of women's issues that certainly fueled the activism in the sense that we need to be heard. At that, the women's, I can't remember if it was a women's task force or a women's commission in GSA, was very much an activist group, and very, very much seeking to influence policy. Um, so it was, it, what, what drove us was trying to heighten awareness of women's issues and I can remember the first time a group of women gerontologists got together at GSA. It was a very small group, you know, and now it would be huge. Um, so my own work evolved from the need to address women's issues and how issues of aging affect women differently than they affect men and the inequities. Moved from that kind of focus to my merging by bringing together the work I had done in feminist social work with gerontology and, and addressing issues more from a feminist gerontological perspective uh, in terms of understanding oppression and s structural inequities and how those get played out, played out across the life course for women, particularly because of their unpaid or underpaid caregiving roles. So it, you know, it shifted to me from quote, a women's issues perspective to a feminist gerontological perspective. Um, yeah. So has, how has being a gerontologist interacted with your own personal aging process? Well, I think it's always easier to write and talk about aging than sometimes to experience it. <laughs> And I think that's primarily in terms of that we still live in a very ageist society. You know, it's just, I think I talk to so many of my women friends and we all have that experience of being invisible in certain settings as an older woman. And um, the, the ageism that one encounters even though we have the intellectual understanding, um, even though we know that there's lots of positives about aging, it still can be very painful to, to experience ageism. And, and even to experience ageism from younger gerontologists. You know, and I don't think it's never explicit or it's never intended 
but sometimes unintended. So the, the ageism that one encounters, even if you feel like you're a pretty resilient, strong person, and I, I think about so much if, if it hits me hard, how it must hit a, a woman who doesn't have some of the resources and, and inner reserve that, that I may have. Um, so there's that aspect. I, I think that we all have the benefit if we studied aging that we know so much more about the positives and about and we have many role models that are positive um, that see people who have aged in a healthy manner, aged well, aged with dignity, even if they've dealt with major health issues. So I think we're very fortunate that we have we have the knowledge, we have the role models, we have the sort of attitude um, from learning from uh, older adults to always keep focused that there are many positives of aging. Sometimes my friends get really tired <laughs> of me trying to always put a positive twist. Because <laughs> admittedly, you know, if you're facing health problems or you're living with chronic pain, then it's sometimes a positive twist can feel um, like a, which is Pollyanna go away. But again, we, I think because our knowledge base is so much stronger than the average person, that we can approach aging in a much more positive way. I, I, the, the one other thing I think I'd want to add, when I was talking about um, moving the feminist gerontological perspective, that it's so important that, to me, that that is intersecting and that by trying to address ageism, that it recognizes the intersectionality with issues of race and sexual orientation and class and disability. Uh, I don't want to come across, uh, which was a challenge for feminism in sort of the second wave of feminism, that it was seen as a white woman's uh, perspective and focused on issues that weren't always salient to women of color or to low-income women. And I think in feminist gerontology that so much of what has driven my commitment in that area is the inequities that low-income women of color face that are embodied in the fact that the poorest group in our society is African-American women over age 75. Um, we often lose sight of that with our focus on child childhood poverty. So I just want to really make clear about the important, to me, the importance of looking at the intersectionality of age with these other attributes. At the same time, I often feel that in my work with social work students that who are really committed to anti-oppression work, committed to social justice, they don't think about aging as a social justice issue. They think only of other groups. And so the other side of it is that making sure those, those people who are teaching courses on cultural diversity or doing trainings, that they recognize the need to include age within that approach. So that's sort of both sides of that. The WIGL project focuses on the legacies of older women gerontologists. Within that framework, is there anything else you would like us to know? Um, I feel like I've, I mean, I think that one sense to me of having an impact as a gerontologist and then as a woman gerontologist is, of course, in the students that you've impacted. It's, of course, in the other faculty you've impacted. Um, that's what we all get meaning from, and then hopefully it's that these other individuals that you've, that you've taught or you've um, done research on or you've done a presentation with, that ultimately it's improving the lives of older people and particularly of older women. So to me that is what sort of 
motivates one at all points in one career in one's career but I think the concept of mentoring certainly the concept of generativity of giving back of seeing the impact on younger generations that that's really what has such great meaning uh, as you think about one's legacy it's really what matters um, I think there's nothing that means as much to me as to have a former student talk about the impact, how I got them to think about aging, how maybe I recruited them to gerontological social work, how something in one of my classes really had an impact, you know, and that they have gone on and remained committed in the field and are, are really trying to make a difference in the lives of older adults. And I hope that they're treating older women <laughs> in healthcare settings much better than my mother was treated. On the other hand, as I said at the beginning, I sadly think there's still too many instances where because of ageism, sexism, classism, if perhaps racism, um, that there probably are still older women who, ex who are seen as second class as I felt my mother was viewed. Or maybe I didn't have that concept then, but perhaps that she was invisible to the healthcare providers who were working with her. So it comes back around to making sure that the, whatever our discipline, that we're really impacting the way in which those who we educate um, are impacting older adults.